prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you because your spirit is our teacher and our guide. We welcome him to guide us into all truths. We are receive unction by your spirit to speak accurately according to your will to the hearts of your people. And I declare by faith that we are all living here imparted with faith and wisdom to be doers of your word. And to bring praise and glory to your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So what have we been talking about? Prayer. Is that all? Prayer and the new creation. That's what we were talking about. Hallelujah. Say prayer and the new creation. Who is the new creation? Aha, uh -huh, we are the new creations. So, today we're going to talk about prayer and God's word. That's a subtopic in the whole series. Prayer and God's word. And God's word is meant to be an indispensable companion to prayer. You are actually meant to, they are meant to, reading the word, spending time in the word of God and prayer are actually meant to be inseparable. <coughs> They shouldn't be separate in the life of a believer. You don't, you don't say you want to go into the word and not include prayer. And you don't say you want to go into prayer without in, including the word of God. Actually, if you understand proper spiritual living, you realize that you can't go far in the word of God without prayer. You can't. What you just have is an intellectual exercise. And you can't go far in prayer without God's word. What you will have is a religious spiritual practice or gymnastic with many frustrations. You may have limited results, but there will be many frustrations. Uh, prayer helps us to build intimacy with God and with his word. See, God's word is a living thing. That's what the Bible says. The word of God is living. And if prayer ceases to have that living element to it, if the word of God doesn't speak to you, if you don't hear from God, it, when you open your, the pages of the Bible, most likely there's something not so right in your prayer life. If you talk to the author, he will speak to you with his word. Many people say, I don't hear God speak to me. Maybe because your Bible is closed. Hallelujah. Prayer, the Bible says the word of God has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. The word of God makes great provisions for us. Prayer is one of the means by which we access the provisions that have been made for us in God's word. Through prayer, God's word is illuminated to us. It when you pray, God's word comes to you with light. David said the entrance of the word gives light. Prayer helps you to, ask, to be illuminated by God's word. The same scriptures you've been reading for years, over and over again, when you maintain a healthy prayer life, that same scripture becomes a fresh encounter with God. Do you understand? Some people wonder, how can, how can you read the same book over and over again? Not because it's new. Because it's a person speaking to me. Because it's a there's a person speaking. I speak to him, he speaks back to me. When you talk to God in the place of prayer and you open the scriptures, God uses the scriptures to speak to your hearts. Prayer helps you to act on the word of God effectively. The Bible tells us we should be doers of the word. Not just hearers only. Prayer helps. And the word of God enables us to pray. Prayer helps us act on the word. The word of God enables us to pray effectively. Now, many people pray. Many people pray. Few get results. Hallelujah. But answered prayer is actually guaranteed. The, Jesus said, ask and you shall be given. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask and you ask whatever you will, and it will be done unto you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? The, prayer, the word of God guarantees prayer. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, we know, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, gets much results. 
the word of God guarantees results in prayer. But if you don't understand God's word and the rules that govern prayer, and you approach God without revelation, and you approach God, communicating with God in prayer, but flouting the rules he set in his word, you will be frustrated. There will be failure. There will be prayer failures. And so what you will have is a religion of prayer, a habit of praying, but not the results that are promised in the scriptures. God's word, because we're talking about prayer and the new creation, God's word reminds us and assures us of our rights, our privileges, and our positions before God. There's a manner of approach the believer has. Last week we talked about confidence in prayer. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne. Come boldly to the throne. Boldly. That's your manner of approach. Why should I be bold before God? Because I'm his child. The Bible says I'm his child. I'm beloved to, before him. I'm loved by God. Why should I be bold before him? Because I have the right to pray in the name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus is a sign check to the resources of heaven. To the unlimited resources of heaven. Because he, in his word he calls me his very righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ. God sees me. He sees me in Christ. He looks upon me as one, a man united with the Lord Jesus. Because that's what I am. To pray in the name of Jesus means to approach the Father with the very authority, standing, and recognition that Jesus has. When you stay in the word, the word of God gives you an accurate picture of how the father sees you and how the father has chosen to deal with you or respond to you. When people approach prayer without a rich understanding of God's word, they have a very limited experience. They approach God with uncertainty, like beggars. God, please, do it. I hope you can do it. Paul prayed, asked the, he, told the, he told the saints in Philippi, he said, These shall turn to me for my deliverance because of your prayer. He told Philemon, he said, prepare a room for me. Because you've prayed, I'm going to be released from prison. <laughs> he didn't say because my lawyer said, he didn't say because, you know, I have someone high up in government that's, you know, guaranteed. You know, he said, because you prayed, prepare a room for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? The quality of your prayer, of your prayer life, is tied to the quality of your fellowship and understanding of God's word. The quality of your prayer life is tied to the quality of God's word and your understanding of God's word. Let's open our Bible to the book of Ephesians 6, 18, NIV. Ephesians 6, 18. God's word presents before us supernatural realities. The word of God is a very accurate picture of how things are in the realm of the spirits. It presents to us supernatural realities. It presents to us the power of God, the reality of angels. It presents to us the Father in heaven. The possibilities of God. All, with God, all things are possible. And all things are possible to him that believes. Prayer helps us to navigate and access those spiritual realities. Now, Ephesians 6, 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer. All kinds of prayer and request. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. It says, there are different kinds of prayer. It says pray with all kinds of prayers. Say, not all prayers are the same. Yeah, there are different kinds of prayer. There are different kinds of prayer. Some people like to end every prayer with, thy will be done. Thy will be done. They say, because Jesus prayed, thy will be done. But Jesus did not always pray, thy will be done. In fact, there was only one place in the scripture where he says, thy will be done. That was at the Garden of Gethsemane. And that was a prayer of what you call a prayer of consecration. When you're about to make a decision and you're not sure what the will of God is, you pray that it will be done. At the tomb of Lazarus, he didn't pray that it will be done. He said, Father, I thank you because you've heard me. And then he said, Lazarus comforts. Hallelujah. That was the prayer of thanksgiving. But he had prayed a prayer of petition before because he said, you've, I, I thank you because you have heard me. 
he prayed a prayer of petition. And then at the tomb of Lazarus, he prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. It's not every time you pray a prayer of petition. Particularly after you've prayed it before. Sometimes you're meant to respond. The next prayer you pray after your petition should be thanksgiving. Because the first time God heard you. Now you're in a receiving mood. Paul and Silas in prison in Acts 16. They prayed. And then they began to praise. Praise is a form of prayer. It's interacting with God. It's celebrating who God is and what God has done. It's a form of prayer. And in the place of praise, the answer was manifest. Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel. They prayed. They made a request to God. They sought, they said, our eyes are on you. We want you to intervene. And then God gave a word and they responded to that word in praise. Another kind of prayer. There's a prayer of agreement where the Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. There's a prayer I pray for myself. There's a prayer I pray for someone else. I can pray a prayer of supplication for someone else or I can pray a prayer of intercession for someone else. God's word teaches us what the best type of prayer to pray in different situations and in different scenarios. And of course, we have, we have the help of the Holy Spirit to help us and direct us as well. Now let's go to our golden text, which is um, John chapter 15, verse 7. We're going to read it in the New King James Version. John chapter 15, verse 7. Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's giving them, from, if, if you study the book of John, the gospel of John, from... The middle part of 13, John 13 to John 17, Jesus is giving the disciples a glimpse of how life will be after he has departed. He's giving them a picture of life after his resurrection. And then he tells them in, in the beginning of John 15, he tells them, I am the vine, you are the branch, and all that. He was explaining the kind of relationship he will have which believer, the kind of union that was about to take place between them. And one of the things he said in verse 7, he says, if you abide in me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. Hallelujah. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done. It shall be done. Your desires are going to be accomplished in the place of prayer. But there's a caveat. There is a condition. And that condition is that you have intimate fellowship with my word. My word has to live in you. That word abide is a very strong term. You see, if I come to your house, I'm not abiding. I'm, I'm visiting. I may linger for a while. I may even spend a few days. But I, I have to leave. I go. If I don't leave, <laughs> that's a different scenario. <laughs> I have to go. But you stay there. God's word should not be visited by the believer. It should stick. Does it mean I should be reading my Bible 24 hours of a day? Nope. But you spend enough time with the word so that it never leaves you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Spend enough time with the word so that it never leaves you. How is that possible? If you've ever experienced a breakup before, and you know how that thing stays in your mind for throughout the whole day, even when you're doing other things, uh -huh, that's, how they, that's how it hits. <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the word they use nowadays? They, say, they serve breakfast, I mean, and they serve you breakfast. <laughs> it stays in your mind all day. Yeah, you can spend enough time with the word so that it captures your thinking. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, we can give you ideas. Oh, you know, read five chapters of the Bible every day or, do all, or meditate on the word. No, what the key thing is is spend enough time with the word until it is the governing rule in your mind. My word abides in you. My word abides in you. God's word is supernatural. It is the very life of God. It is God himself. God and his word are one. How do you think 
you can succeed in prayer if, you, if the word of God does not have a place of importance in your heart. So have you ever experienced someone who you are having a conversation with someone or that friend who is very, has very little interest in what you have to say but has a, a great interest in giving you a piece of their mind. That's not a good relationship, you know that. That doesn't really work well. That's the way a lot of believers are. God's word doesn't really amount much to them, but oh, they can talk to God. They feel that God has to listen to them. Imagine, the person who knows very little wants to do all the talking to someone who knows everything. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you want to have a wholesome relationship with God, his word has to have a deep impact in your heart. Prayer is effective for the man or the woman who has allowed God's word to be priority, who has allowed God's word to be the governing, the governing force in their being. It is we, for the purpose of teaching, that say, oh, prayer and the word. To God is one thing. When you are listening to his word, you are communing with him. When you are talking to him, you are communing with him. His word is alive. His word is alive. His word is a living being. Jesus is called the living word. So respect the word. Respect the word. Respect. There's a scripture. It wasn't, I, wasn't, I didn't plan to say it. Let, let, let me look for it. A, it talks about the man to whom I will look upon. Let me quickly search for it. It says, to this person I will look upon who trembles at my word. Hallelujah. Trembles at my word. Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, is it that? Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I think I have the wrong scripture. Word. Yeah, sorry, Isaiah 66, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 66. Verse 2. I'm going to read it in the King James Version. It says, For all these things hath my hand made, and all these things have been said, have been said. For all these things hath my hand made, and all these things have been, said the Lord. But to this man will I look, look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. The person that is going to get God's attention is the one who has allowed his heart to be in such submission and awe to God's word. Do you understand that? If you want to get God's attention, if you want to draw his heart towards you, let his word dominate your heart and your thinking. Hallelujah. So success in prayer is tied to letting God's word abide in our hearts. People who have been mighty in the realm of prayer have been mighty in God's word. Mighty in God's word. The word of God is not something you just read like a text. Like a textbook. You read it over and over again. You take time to meditate upon it. Meditate. What does it mean to meditate? To think deeply. Sometimes you mortify to yourself. You say to yourself over and over again. Last week I talked to us about um, a certain man by the name of George Muller. It was a German man who came to England in the 1700s, 1800s, 1700 stroke 1800s. And he, he opened an orphanage. This man was very effective in prayer and he would spend hours in study and meditation of the word of God. And when he prayed, he would never look at the circumstance. He would always look at the promises. And no matter how bleak things seem to be, he will always keep pointing to God's word. He will literally physically point to the word while he's talking to God in prayer. Like you said this in your word. You said this in your word. There was another man by the name of Charles G. Finney. He was a, um, an evangelist and a mighty revivalist. He said whenever he goes to God in prayer because he was a lawyer, he will go before God and say, you can't deny my request because your word says, ask and it shall be given. 
He said, I had experiences in prayers that alarmed me. He said, he was shocked at the way he would be so bold before God. Like something just possesses him. Because when the word of God takes hold of your heart, there's a faith that cannot be denied. Faith comes by hearing God's word. Faith comes by hearing God's word. God wants us to be so full of his word that when we come to him in prayer, not only is there an assurance, there's a boldness. There's a boldness. See, your spirit has already made connection with God. Prayer is just taking advantage of that connection you have made with God. God and his word are one. If you immerse yourself in that word, you can't be denied. You can't be denied. Now, let's go to 1 John 5. New King James. 1 John 5, we're going to read from verse 14 and 15. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. John said here, he says, Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Prayer is born out of confidence. The believer must be confident. We talked about it last week. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. Part of your confidence in prayer is knowing that, first of all, how God sees you. I said that earlier. But also knowing that you are praying in harmony with his will. Do you understand that? There are certain things that God wants. There are certain things that God says you can have. It is useless to go before God and pray and ask him to do things that is contrary to his nature. Do you understand that? Some people have seen, some people see God as their personal um, hit man. You know? A mob boss that has like, okay, God, that, those my enemies are my haters. Go and show them. Go and strike them. You said, but David prayed those kind of prayers in the book of Psalms. Yes, David was the seed of David. One, it was the seed of David. Sorry, sorry, it was the seed of, it was the, Dave, Jesus is the seed of David. He knew that the Messiah was meant to come from his lineage. One, so he had to be preserved at all costs. Two, there was no redemption in the Old Testament. There was no blood redemption for people outside of Israel in the Old Testament. So your enemies were not covered. But in the New Testament, the death of Jesus is for everybody, including your enemies. The forgiveness of God is for everybody, including your enemies. Do you understand that? So you don't go around sending God on personal assignments to kill your enemies or to make life difficult for them. That's against his will. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. And the prayer was not to <laughs> it was not to shame them or to hurt them. Okay. God doesn't entertain certain prayers. God is not committed to your greed. The Bible says, he that will not walk, let him not eat. Right? You can't say, I will live by faith, but I won't do anything. And expect God to do a miracle. It's against his principles. Do you understand that? God doesn't answer prayers that are against his nature or his principles. The word of God is meant to acquaint you with God's nature and his principles. He said, but what if I don't know if what I'm asking for is God's perfect will for me? And there are two things. First of all, the prayers of God covers our personal desires. God wants to meet your desires. It's not everything, God, what kind of house should I live? Which house should I live in? No. God may have a desire, a desire about where you live, as in, hey, live in Northampton. But what, what kind of house you live in is your choice. Do you understand what I'm saying? What kind of car you drive is your choice. There are certain things that are within the range of your personal choice. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, the Bible says, ask and you shall be given. God wants to meet your needs. Wholesome desires. The Bible says he satisfies the desire of every living creature. There are certain things that are specific about your life. Certain things, for example, I can't ask God to give me a second wife. It's not happening. 
I can't ask God to give me another person's wife. Neither can you. It's, like, it's against his will. And against the will of certain people. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is a giver of good things. Matthew 7, 7. Now, certain things are not in God's perfect will, but they are in his permissive will. And it's important to be intelligent when it comes to timing. For example, God wanted Israel to have a king, but it was not yet time. He said in the Old Testament that they would have a king, but it wasn't yet time. But he asked for a king. And you know what? He gave them a king. He even anointed the king for them. But it was out of timing, and he warned them it wouldn't end well, and exactly like predicted, it didn't end well. But why did he answer that prayer? Because it was part of his will, except they were asking out of time. And that's why sometimes when you're praying, you have to be intelligent about what you are asking God for, particularly in things you are not 100% certain. Now, I know that certain things are normal. For example, if there's sickness, don't go around and invent a theology that says God wants someone to be sick for his glory. Sickness does not bring glory to God. There's no place in the Bible that says sickness is, will bring glory. When the Bible talks about, um, what's his name? Lazarus' sickness uh, bring glory to God. It was in his resurrection. Hallelujah. It was in his resurrection from there. That's where the, how the glory came. The way sickness brings glory to God is by healing. And it's someone dies by resurrection. Hallelujah. Jesus, the Bible says, he bore our sicknesses and our infirmities. And by his stripes, we are healed. The death of Jesus paid the price for the healing of every individual on earth. It is always God's will to heal. Everyone that came to Jesus, every single person that came to Jesus in the Bible for healing, received healing. You know, like I said, I, li I like this movie. I like the series, the Chosen series. I mean, but there was a scene there I saw, I'm like, nah, this is not, <laughs> it's not scriptural. <laughs> Someone came to Jesus and he said, I don't know, I wait, not, not now. You, no, I said, no, no, no. Someone, they're trying to comfort someone that say, oh, you are sick and God is not ready to heal you now because he wants, mm -mm. Jesus healed every single person that came to him. Every single person that came to Jesus was healed. Because it's always the Father's will. It's always the Father's will to heal. Hallelujah. He described healing as, he said, if your animal falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, would you not pull it out, even though it's on the Sabbath day? That's the way he sees a sick person. A sick person is like a man in a ditch who has fallen into a ditch. He is going to help you out. He's going to bring you out. He's going to restore you to wholeness. So when you come before God in prayer for certain things, there's a boldness. He's my healer. The provision for my healing has been made. He's my shepherd. I shouldn't be in want. I should not be in lack. So when I pray for provision, I know there's a guarantee. Do you understand that? Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it will be given. It will be given. See, Jesus is not trying to preach religion or trying to encourage us with our human experience. He's trying to tell us how things occur in the realm of heaven. When the believer asks, there is a response from God. God's response is to give. The angel told Daniel, from the first day you prayed, the command was given. The delay was not in God's hand. It was in the enemy trying to bring the delay. So Daniel stayed in prayer and in faith until the answer came. The believer is meant to stay in faith until the answer is manifest. Because from the first day you make your request, God responds. The unfortunate thing is that many times when God shows up, people give up. The angel came and told Zechariah, your prayer has been answered. And pray. Zechariah was always thinking, which prayer is that? Oh, that one? Ah. <laughs> Me, I've already given up on the prayer. The angel said, we'll strike you dumb so I can't mess up the process. He said, your prayer has been answered. The day he prayed, it was in God's register, and God decided to respond. Ask, and it shall be what? Given. The moment I ask, the, mechanic, the, 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 the mechanics has been set in motion in heaven. The transaction has been made. There is a response from the Father. 
Seek and you will find. When you start seeking wisdom, when you start seeking the will of God, revelation is already on his way. Say revelation is on his way. It says knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. And what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? When you ask, you are not bothering God. God wants you to bring your request to him. He wants to fill your life with good things. He wants to. He's yearning to. He wants to give good things. And he knows how to give good things. He knows what good things are. Hallelujah. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. What things soever you desire. So there's a place for my desires. God wants to respond to my desires in the place of prayer. Hallelujah. He says, whatever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Psalm 37 verse 4. 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts. Hallelujah. But let's examine this thing about desire because desire is a key function in prayer has been answered. You see, God isn't committed to your casual wishes. Oh, I'd like to have a mansion. Do you really desire it or are you just casually wishing for it? It doesn't respond to casual wishes. Desire, something that is inborn, that won't go. Hallelujah. Something you long for. But then you also have to watch the quality of your desires. Because not all desires are the same. Not all strong desires are the same. <laughs> Hallelujah. Open your Bible to the book of um, James in the Passion Translation. It's also Jacob. <laughs> James in the Passion Translation. James chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 1 to 4. There are certain desires that God cannot entertain, like I said earlier, because it goes against his nature and his principles. Now, if you delight yourself in the Lord... It will sanctify your desires. If you abide in the word, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. If you abide in God's word, it will cleanse your heart and your motives of the wrong desires. But let's look at what James said here that can cause believers not to receive in the place of prayer. So in the Passion Translation, he says, what is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way, the battle on your inside, and fulfill your own desires? You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme with envy and harm and harm others to, satis to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you coil and fight. And all the time, you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. You see, the reason why some people don't get it is because they don't ask. As a reason why some people don't have, because just simply because they don't ask. Okay, that's one reason. It says, and if you ask, then some ask, you won't receive. You know this is now. It's not as if God won't give. It's that you won't receive, because receiving is something you do actively. If you ask, you won't receive for what you are asking. Sorry, if you ask, you won't receive it for you are asking with corrupt motives. Seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair. An unholy relationship with the world. Don't you see that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Do you see that? You see, we live in an environment that is filled with worldly influences. When you go on social media, who are you following? Whose post are you reading? When you're on TV, what are you learning? Because when you're, listen, believe me, even though as you're being entertained, you're also learning. Information is being passed across. Values are being sent. They are being reinforced and they are being introduced into your system. If you are getting to the place where the Bible talks about in the, in the Bible of the soul about people whose hearts are being choked... They are being choked with 
the worries of life and the, the lust of other things, the distraction of the age. When the world's values and standards fill your heart, when you are wanting certain things to, from, to fulfill lustful desires, say for example, how many of you agree that a Mercedes Benz is a good car? It's a good car. Okay, some people don't like Mercedes Benz. But yeah, you have something great in mind. Yeah. You said? What did you say? It's a good car. Even if you don't like it. It's a good car. Okay? Now, God is not against a believer driving a Mercedes Benz. I mean, if you know that. He's not against it. But God can be opposed to it if you want to let them know that you have arrived. Let them know that I'm serving the living God. <laughs> Let the haters choke. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, the motive matters. Is it a corrupt motive or is it a wholesome? Say, God, I want a Benz because, you know, I don't want to have stress in my cars. I want to drive from point A to point B with smoothness, with comfort. Wholesome desires. God says, yes, my child, I want what's good for you. Hallelujah. But do you understand what I'm saying? You can frustrate your prayer with corrupt desires. Wanting it for the wrong reasons. Wanting it to fulfill your lust. And let me tell you something. Lust, many times, is not easy to get rid of. You have to stay in the word. Cleanse your heart and your soul with the word of God. He said in... One time I was, I was reading a book by an evangelist. He said some people want their children to be saved because so that they can go to church together. It's more than that, too. It's more than that. So that their soul will be saved. So that they will not, they will miss, they will miss, they will, they will miss hell. They will miss heaven. You should have a, a, a more wholesome desire in mind. One time when I was, I was, I was, I was believing God to come to, the country, to this country, and God like, asked me, why do you want to come to the UK? I'm like, ah, my wife is there. I need to move. He said, mm -mm -mm -mm. why do you want to be? Why, why, what is the reason I want you to be here? And I said, yeah, to come and do ministry. He said, yes. That's the only thing I want you to talk to me about. When you focus on the right reason and the right desires, you get what you want. Listen, um, Pastor was talking to almost for six months. Within a matter of days, Instantly, when I got my desires right, my priorities right, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. When people come to me and tell me they have immigration issues, I tell them, I ask them, find out God's purpose for you being in this country. Once you find it out, the rest is history. If you are wanting to be here or do things for your own personal reasons, we might struggle. But if you can connect it to a divine assignment, to a wholesome motive, then God can step in. Sometimes, just prioritizing the needs of others can get you there faster. Do you understand what I'm saying? Prior, not, see, selfishness, Wanting, putting your needs above other people's needs can actually limit you. Do you realize that there was a time when I was in school and I was believing God, I was short of finances and I was believing God for provision. And he said, you know, if you just expand your desire and desire for more so that you can bless others. It shall, can you imagine? I'm so imagine this, you're believing God for say 100 pounds and God says, you know what, if you believe for 200 pounds so I can give extra, you get it faster. And I tried it and it worked. He said, don't just believe for food to eat. Believe for seeds to sow. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? You can make your desires more wholesome by letting... Abraham wanted a son. God wanted a nation. So God said, hey, you have a need? I have a need. Let's come together. Let's make a covenant. This woman, um, trying to remember, Penina, um, the mother of Samuel, trying to remember the name, Hannah, yeah. She went to God and said, Look, give me a child, I'll give him to you.
God didn't just give her one child. He gave her children. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like her desires mixed with God's desire. She sanctified her desires. Do you understand? You can have sanctified desires and connect with God. God is committed to meeting wholesome desires. He cannot meet, he doesn't go after, he doesn't satisfy selfish or corrupt or worldly desires. Because worldliness is an enemy of God. Now, let's look at some instructions in prayer. John 16, 23 to 24. Now, these instructions are very important. You may say, well, it doesn't matter how you pray. Now, sometimes when people are trying to encourage people to pray, they tell them to just, it's easy, just talk to God. And yes, talk to God. By all means, talk to God. And see, the way God deals with a baby Christian, it's not the same way he's going to deal with a Christian who has been in the faith for a while. Many people experience this thing. They'll be like, when I first became a believer, anything I prayed for, I got it. If I need healing, it happened so quickly. After a while, things began to get a bit difficult. Nah, God is, one, God is treating you like a grown-up. There's certain things that if a 10-year-old comes home and says, I want to eat, I want to eat, and starts making a tantrum, before you give that child food, you first of all make sure his butts <laughs> hears from you. Or some African mothers will give him a slap that will reconfigure. Back to factory settings. Like, can you not speak normally? Now, if a two-year-old does that or a one-year-old does that, you know. In fact, <laughs> babies, men... I always tell, I, when, when, one time when my, my niece was living with us and she was making a man of tando, I said, I said, your day is coming. Your day is coming. One of these days, <laughs> we are running around trying to serve you right now. Your day is coming. So when she grew up and she was now, we're now sitting now in her hands and she'd be giving us a face. I was like, when you're a baby, we're running around for you. Now is our time. <laughs> you will run around for us. Babies just have to make noise. And everybody's running around for them. And some believers, when they are baby Christians, they make noise, God shows up. Miracles happen. But when they grow up, God says, hey, I have, a, I, have a, I have an instruction manual here. He says, in that day you shall ask me nothing. Jesus is talking. Prayer is made to the Father in the name of Jesus. Someone said, I'd like to talk to Jesus. Yeah, you can talk to him, but you don't ask him for things in prayer. He says, in that day you shall ask me what? Nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name. Do you see that? You ask the Father in my name. So when I approach God in prayer, I go on the basis of the authority, the identity, and the position of Christ. That's what the name means. I approach the Father with the standing of Christ. I can't be denied. What is the Father? So I pray to the Holy Spirit. No, you can talk to the Holy Spirit. You can commune with the Holy Spirit. You can ask him to help you to do what the word says he will do. But you don't pray to the Holy Spirit. He helps you to pray to the Father. Do you understand that? These things matter, particularly as you're growing in prayer. The instructions are there for a reason. Don't think you can flout the instructions of God's word because you had results in time past. No, you stick with the word. Not, you're not chasing results. You're sticking with the word. Results, it's good to have results, but make sure you do it according to the word. If you ignore God's word because it worked the last time, you might <laughs> experience some failures because you are ignoring God's word. You can't ignore God's word and expect to be continuously successful in the place of prayer. Now, another thing is that one of the things that makes you powerful in the place of prayer is to pray God's priorities. There's a principle that says, seek first the kingdom. Do you understand that? Seek first the kingdom, and all these other things will be added unto you. There was a time when I was, I was with a certain brother. God sent me to God's minister to a certain brother, and he was going through some difficult situations. Like, he was, was battling with depression. Basically, everything was tied to his immigration situation. So he couldn't work. He's having financial problems. His relationship was in a limbo. And when we're praying, we never for once prayed about the immigration situation because we're not led to. We were worshiping God and we're praying about ministry. And within less than three months, everything was sorted out. Everything, immigration, marriage, ministry, provision and finances, sorted out. Why? Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. 
and all these other things will be added unto you. Sometimes in the place of prayer, the leading of the Holy Spirit will give you a key point to pray about. And you won't even have to pray about other things. So you have to find out what are God's priorities in the place of prayer. If your prayer is centered around selfishness, God bless me, my wife, my two children, us four, no more. God's like, okay. <laughs> Babies can have some measure of results. But after a while, God says, Mr. Man, you have to do more than that. Your prayer is meant to be a tool in the hand of God. You have a need, God has a need as well. God wants to use your prayer life and your prayer time to accomplish his will. Prioritize the will of God. Now, one of the things we notice in scriptures, when you study the epistles, the epistles are the letters of Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude. These are the letters that were written to the church. What was the priority in prayer? It was for the saints. It was for the saints. It was for the spiritual well-being of the saints. What was Jesus' priority in prayer in John 17? In John 17, we see Jesus in prayer to the Father. What was he doing? He's praying for the saints. Do you understand that? Let them be one as we are one. He's praying for the saints. He even went away as I began saying, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for my own. Because if I pray for my own, if it is well with the saints, the saints will be empowered to become a light to the world. Do you understand what I'm saying here? If you pray for the world and the saints are falling, when the world comes into the church, they're coming into a broken church. So it's important. The church matters to God. First of all, it is his family. Secondly, it is his house, his temple. It is his means for reaching the rest of the world. His heart is burning to reach the world. But for him to be able to effectively reach the world, he needs a strong church. And so you notice, for example, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, Paul is praying for the saints there. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about it, we do not cease. Look at it. We do not cease. We don't stop in prayer. To pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. He didn't say, I'm praying that it's your turn to shine. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying prayers of prosperity, but he's prioritizing their spiritual well-being. These people need to be strong. They need to be under the influence of the spirit. They need to be able to walk in the fullness of God's will. Every other thing that is necessary will fall in line when you prioritize this type of praying. So he prays for the saints. In chapter 4 of that same Colossians, verse 12, it talks about Epaphras. Epaphras, who is one of you, a born servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all of God's will. Do you see that? There are priorities in the place of prayer. There's a reason why these scriptures are in the Bible, because God wants us to know what his priorities are and how we should approach him in the place of prayer. When the Bible says, seek first the kingdom, these are practical ways to seek first the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And that thing is that you pray for your enemies. Like we mentioned earlier, Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies. That's, that, that, that lets you know it's not prayer that God will <laughs> strike them down. Love your enemies. See, let me tell you something. God is love, right? Satan is the author of hatred and enmity and strife. If your enemy strikes you or hurts you and you continue in hatred towards him, you have yielded to the devil. The purpose of Satan allowing your enemy to hurt you is so that you can get into hatred and unforgiveness and lose the blessings of God. The Bible says in uh, Matthew, sorry, no, Mark eleven twenty five. 25, that if you're praying and you have anything in your heart against someone, forgive. Otherwise, you won't be forgiven and you can't receive answers to your prayer. And so, when someone comes against you, when someone is hurting you, when people are treating you bad and, they're trying to, and you're, you're, you're tempted with, with, with unforgiveness, realize that it's Satan trying to sabotage your work with God. And so, the best response... The Bible says, it's not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. Do you understand that? 
Don't be overcome with evil, the Bible says. Overcome evil with good. The love of God is superior to the hatred that is in the world. The light of God's love. Love is light. Light will drive away darkness. Don't succumb to hatred or bitterness. Let hatred and bitterness be overcome with the love of God in your heart. So it says, love your enemies. Pray for, bless those who curse you. They curse, you bless. <laughs> when they curse, you don't say, ah, you think you have mouth. Bitch, you have mouths too. <laughs> it's a hard fact. No, use your mouth to bless. Hallelujah. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 7, verse 59. Let's see it practice. See, when Jesus was being crucified, what did he pray? Father, forgive them because they don't know what to do. So he prayed. He practiced what he preached. He didn't curse his enemies. He never did. He prayed for them. Now, look at what happened. This is a man like us. Verse 59 of Acts chapter 7. And they stoned Stephen. As he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So here is a man who has preached the word of God. He rebuked them for their hard-heartedness. And they dragged him out. And they began to physically hurt him with a murderous intention to kill him. This man, they wanted him dead. And when they said they were stoning him, it wasn't small pebbles. Massive stones. They are tearing, it is tearing his skin. It is breaking his bones. And the first thing he tells his God, says to God is, receive my spirit, because he knows his time has come. Then the Bible says, he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, with his last breath, with his last energy. What was he saying? Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Can you imagine that? Murderers. People destroying him. Ending his life and his ministry on the earth. And with his last breath, he says, do not charge them with this sin. Because love always wins. That's the power of love. We don't go into prayer with hatred or bitterness. When you feel hatred or, 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 or hurt in your heart towards someone in the place of prayer, begin to bless them. That's how you conquer in the place of prayer. Do you know what happened? This prayer was what gave us Apostle Paul. Because Apostle Paul... Then was Saul was actually leading the charge against them. He was the number one hater. <laughs> but when God said, when, when, when Philip said, sorry, um, Stephen said, don't charge this into them. If he hadn't prayed that prayer, Paul would have been history. He would have never, he would have never existed. Because you see, the greatest sin, if you study the Bible, you read this is the greatest sin is to try and stop the spread of the gospel. That is the greatest sin. To try to stop the spread of the gospel. Something that Jesus died to give to all humanity. You are trying to stop it from spreading. That was the greatest sin. And yet he prayed, don't, don't. And God now used the person who ended the life of, of a servant to become his own number one apostle. That's the mercy and the grace of God. That's someone seeking first God's kingdom. I believe eh, that when Paul is receiving his rewards in heaven... Stephen will be receiving the same reward as well. In addition to other things. Praise God. Another thing we do in prayer is that we pray for ministers of the gospel. Very important. Major priority in the Bible. First thing, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 to 38, Jesus said, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, into his harvest. This nation needs that prayer. Ministers, laborers need to be sent to the harvest field. And when the Bible talks about sent, <laughs> it's not just talking about just go. No. Go in his power. Go in his strength. Go in his authority. Go with his living word and with his spirit moving through you and manifest through you. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6.18. Now, what happens before Ephesians 6.18? Paul tells us that, oh, um, be sober. I don't know, it says, um, we're wrestling not against flesh and Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. I may be to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. He's telling us that there are mighty 
dark forces, beings at war against us. We are wrestling against them. Now, he's not telling us to be afraid of them. He's telling us, first of all, take on the strength of God. And then he now gives us a powerful strategy of spiritual warfare. Verse 18 says, praying always. How often? Always. Without prayer and supplication. For every saint. So every believer should be prayed for. Every believer should have spirit-led prayer covering them. Then he now said, and pray for me. Pray for me. The man of God was not ashamed to say, pray for me. That utterance will be given to me. Do you understand that? Pray for me that utterance will be given to me. Not just anybody can open their mouths to speak. But you see, when God gives utterance, when a man of God speaks the living word of God, strongholds are demolished. Bible says in Ephesus, so mightily grew the word and prevailed. People gave up false ideas, false beliefs. The temples were emptied. Do you realize that? They were rioting because the temples were empty. Nobody was buying idols anymore. Because a man of God opened his mouth under the influence and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. A man of God that the saints of God were praying for. That's how, that's the divine strategy for winning nations. For winning territories. Pray for those whom God has sent that God will give them utterance. Hallelujah. In, um, we know what happened in Acts chapter 4. When they were being persecuted. Then he said, God protect us, shield us. They said, God give. They've seen power. They've not seen enough. God, grant unto your servants that with all boldness they will speak your word. Speak your word. Let signs and wonders be done. Stretch forth your hands to heal. And the Bible says in the book of Acts 5, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders done. More people were coming into the church, streaming into the church. Why? Because the saints of God prayed for the people of God. In, um, in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1, it says, Finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, pray for us. That the Lord's, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes. Just as it, when it came to you. Pray to that will be rescued from wicked and evil people. For not everyone is a believer. That's how you seek first the kingdom of God in the place of prayer. You pray for the, for the, for the, for the ministers. We, um, I'm just going to mention it because of time. We also pray for the leaders of the nation. If the easiest thing in the world is to criticize leaders. It doesn't take you much. <laughs> just call the name and you say, this person, huh? he's a useless person. Oh, look at It's very easy. It takes very little effort. But guess what? It accomplishes almost nothing. Bible says to pray for those who are in authority, a divine commandment. And when you pray, expect God to answer your prayers. Don't pray and say, I know he will not change. Ah, yeah, that, ah, that man is a fool. He's a, that, ah. No, when you pray, you stay in faith. Hallelujah. I expect my leaders to be under the influence of God. And if I don't see that evidence, what do I do? I pray more and I stand on the word. I expect, Bible says God is the governor of the nations. Bible says the most high rules in the affairs of men. If they don't shape up, God will remove them. But it's not my job to, to, to curse them. Or to, my job is to pray for them. Hallelujah. And to stay in faith for them. Glory to God. So, we pray for those who are in authority. I'm just going to mention this because of time. It's important. Faith is important. Before prayer, during prayer, and after prayer. The just shall live by faith. You can't pray right if you don't have faith. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe. You have received and you shall have it. The prayer of faith will save the sick. But there's a, there's a very interesting statement here that was read. And I'll, this will be my last scripture. Open to James chapter 1. Verse 2. It said there, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What does a believer do when he's facing difficult times or challenges? Joy. I know it's 
counterintuitive. It goes against the natural tendency. But that's a biblical strategy. Joy. When things are not going the way you want it to go, rejoice. Up. Why? First of all, why should I rejoice? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. I can't be weak. That's one. Two, I know the Father's love for me. He cares about me. I know that God is for me. Before that problem showed up, God already had an answer. So, the devil is not bigger than God. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. So, start with joy. It says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, let patience have a perfect work that it may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And now it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, priority. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach. And it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So let me break that apart. First of all, the strategy is this. Prioritize wisdom. Not say, God, deliver me, deliver me. Sometimes, it's not every time God wants to deliver you from a problem. Sometimes he wants you to go through it with grace. So that people will see. Like, imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego asking God, deliver us from the fire. No, he wants you to go to the fire. He wants the haters to see you in the fire. <laughs> Let them see that the fire can't hurt you. Paul told God, remove the thorn. He said, no, let the thorn meet the grace. Let the grace and the power of God, let it defeat the thorn. Don't, say me, don't ask me to remove the thorn. Ask for the grace. Let the grace come upon you. The grace is the power of God. And so, you pray for wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is seeing things from God's perspective. Do you understand that? Wisdom is divine intelligence, God's way of reasoning. Ask for wisdom. Wisdom will take you out. It will give you God's strategy. It's not every time that God said to take the praisers into the battlefield. But there was a, for, the, for that time in Joseph's time, that was the wisdom. Another wisdom. Sometimes we take your, take your shield, go to the enemy. Or march around the wall. That is wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Priority. But it now says, when you ask, ask in faith. Ask with certainty. Ask with expectation that God is generous and he will give. He now said, certain people won't receive. Not that God did not give, but that they won't receive. Why? Because they were double-minded. They were doubting. They were challenging God's promises in their mind. He says, they will not receive because they put themselves out of order with God. When you pray, Stay in agreement with your prayer. Stay in agreement with the word of God. Stay in agreement with the promises of God. Start prayer with faith. Do it and continue in faith. Don't move out of the faith place by staying in God's word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's get up on our feet. Glory to 